My name is Alfred Okonsi. I'm sitting in for your regular host, Kemeni Amano. Today, I sit with the fearless Samuel Nate George, a member of parliament for the Ningo Pram Pram constituency. He's a deputy ranking on parliament's communications committee and one of the sponsors of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill, which has been approved by parliament awaiting presidential accent. Welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you very much, Alfred. Pleasure to be here. Great. Now, you've been on this path together with the sponsors of this anti-LGBTQ plus bill for over two years. Now, you got a bipartisan approach, in fact, a consensus approval of this bill in Parliament, despite the objections by some of your colleague MPs. Tell me how you did that. Well, let me say hello to our viewers and thank you for this opportunity. I think that we have been on this journey for almost three years. We took it through the debates and we were able to get the bipartisan support of our colleagues by simply taking our time to explain the various pro provisions in the bill. Every single provision was well debated. Mm. Uh, members had their questions, they asked, they were allowed to file amendments, and we debated the, the, the issues thoroughly. And I think that everybody came to a place where they understood and appreciated what the issues we were presenting and representing were. And, and I think that ultimately every member of Ghana's parliament is, is one that is in support of Ghanaian family values. And so they stood with us on it. Everyone in this eighth parliament of the Republic of Ghana supports this anti-LGBTQ plus bill? I believe so. I, people, have had, reality? people have had the opportunity to speak up. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the, when we did the second consideration, the speaker, the second reading, the speaker put the question and said, if anybody had anything against the bill, stand up and speak. Nobody spoke. Um, we went through the various votes on the various amendments. Um, there were over 100 amendments and each mm -hmm. time we went through the amendments. Nobody, uh, no, none of the amendments was defeated that we as sponsors brought forward. And so it's safe to say that um, people may have had reservations on one or two things, but that's, that's the democratic parliamentary process. Mm -hmm. You're able to state your displeasure, but it's always subjected to a vote, and the majority will always carry the day and have their say. I see, I call that one of the objections which uh, the now majority leader Alexander Fenyamakin had, that is before he became majority leader, yes. which eventually withdrew about 15 of them, was yes. that you cannot jail somebody for or over his, his or her sexuality. Th that matter became topical on the floor. You had your, your, your say on that position, but yes, it was, it was withdrawn. But that, that goes along the lines of the many people who have raised concerns about this bill and the, the jail sentence or the jail term in there. Why do you think that should still be in the bill? We're not jailing people on the basis of their sexuality. Um, if you engage in an act that is criminal by our laws, there, there, there's a price to pay for it, there are consequences. Laws are made not just to be reformative, but are also made to be punitive. And, and, and the argument that was being espoused was by Afenio, if I heard him, was not just about sexuality, but about the fact that he thought that people should have an opportunity for reformation. Mm -hmm. Well, our, our jails allow for reformation. There's counseling that goes on in our jails. I think what we should rather be doing is to strengthen the reformative process. The correctional in, aspect uh, of, 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 of the prison, of the prison service. Mm -hmm. Because you have persons, and, and, and I use the same logic he says, that why should someone who, who, who um, has been found guilty of any of the offences in there go to jail? Mm -hmm. um, why, is, why, why do we have young men in, and women in our jails for stealing bunches of plantain or, or a goat? Why, why are people in jail for it's their own lungs for smoking or marijuana? It's simply because the law says it's illegal. The law says it's offensive. And, and, and it's punitive enough to act as a measure to stop you from doing something society finds abhorrent. Uh, Alfred, mm -hmm. I'm sure just like me, there have been days you've woken up and uh, you really don't have money on you, mm -hmm. uh, but you have needs. There's a reason why you don't pass by the nearest bank to you with a weapon to ask the teller to fill up a bag for you mm -hmm. because you know that there's a price to pay. Sure. So that price, that, that punitive measure acts as a restraint on you. So. One society says that this is wrong, this is something we don't, we abhor. And even in the countries where they say they support it, it's not settled. It's a divided, those countries are all divided. Are, there's no unison. There's no country in the world today that is unanimous in its support for homosexuality. There is none, mm -hmm. absolutely none. 
every country that is speaking, from Europe all the way to America, there, there are divisions, very strong divisions. In fact, I can give you clear examples. In the U.S., for example, about 22 states have passed legislation, you know, that, that, that criminalize and ban homosexuality in, 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 in one way or the other. Um, I, 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 believe that, I believe that if I check my records, you would realize that you have over 500 legislations that have gone up since 2021, you know, just dealing with, 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 with homosexuality. Um, if I check my records, 510 anti-LGBTQ bills were introduced in state legislature across the United States in, in just 2023 alone, okay? And I can give you states, Alabama, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Indiana, Wyoming, Utah, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Iowa, uh, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Idaho, okay. Virginia, uh, West Virginia, mm -hmm. Kentucky, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina have all passed legislation against homosexuality. So the, the divisions or the, some of the concerns raised, you're saying essentially it's, it's a global phenomenon. It's, it's normal to have it. Absolutely. You, you have a right. front runner in the US elections coming up, Donald Trump, who is starkly opposed to homosexuality. Mm -hmm. You have the Republican Party taking a strong view of it. You know, so, so, so it's they, not a settled they, they, they case in any of those of countries. There are some members of parliament in this parliament who oppose it in private, but in public, they, they're forced to, 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 as it were, support it because of the, the, the public backlash they would get? You sit in parliament not because of your private opinions, but because you represent the people who voted for you to sit there. So if the people who, who voted for you hold a certain opinion, your view is of no consequence as a member of parliament. It's the view of your constituents. If you were coming there as an independent candidate, that's the, and even if you came there as an independent candidate, people voted for you to come in there. Mm -hmm. And you represent them. You're not sitting in parliament. I'm not sitting in parliament because I am Sam George. I'm sitting in parliament because over 100,000 people, about 100,000 people on the voters register in Ingo Pram Pram went to the polls and majority of them voted for Sam George to become their MP. And that's why before I started sponsoring this bill, I held 18 town hall meetings. In your constituency? In my constituency. Because I want to be sure that I represent the views and opinions of my constituents. So no MP can use their personal idiosyncrasies to speak. And that's why the question has always been asked of MPs who may have voiced opinions. Mm -hmm. Are these your opinions or the opinions of the people you represent? But it's always been the case that you, you have the, the party position and the, and, the, and the constituents position always being either on the same page or sometimes contrasting views. So you have the government or the party of the day having a certain position, the constituents may have a certain position, you have the members of parliament always going according to the party's position. The, the beauty of this bill is it's not been partisan. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been bipartisan in parliament. We've had support from both sides of the house. We have the Honorable John in Team Fodjo, uh, who's the Deputy Minister for Education, as one of the sponsors. The Honorable Chairman Sam Bonsu, immediate past majority leader, was one of the key people who helped us in shaping the law, filed over 40 amendments to the law, contributed immensely to shaping this law as it is. The immediate past Minister for Environment, Science and Technology, uh, the MP for Sefi. Fantastic doctor, Dr. Efriye, mm -hmm. contributed extensively to the discussion on chromosomal structure and its definition, its inclusion in the definition for sex. So it's been a very bipartisan thing. You had Honorable Haruna Idris, Honorable Muntaka Mubarak, Honorable Kaisel Atu Forsen. I, I, I cannot mention people without mentioning his support in carrying this bill through. The right Honorable Speaker himself. And so it's been a bipartisan thing. So, and I mean, the, we've had the NPP, the, 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 uh, chairman of the NPP at their end of year uh, uh, church meeting last year stating emphatically that the NPP is against LGBTQ and supports the bill. The leader of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, in the Eastern region a few weeks ago, about three, four weeks ago, emphatically stated his position. And that's not the first time he's stating his position. He stated his position over and over from when he was vice president to when he became president. In fact, in, I remember in March 2016, I was a presidential mm -hmm. staffer at the time, he went to visit the Scottish Parliament and there was a boycott of him by some Scottish MEPs, uh, MPs simply because of his abhorrence for homosexuality. The president has indicated why he, he may not sign it within that period. So we'll go for this quick break. When we're back, we'll get a bit more into it here on Hot Issues. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're also live here on Hot Issues, also live on TV3 Gun on Facebook, DSV Channel 279. 
live all across the world on 3news.com, also on uh, TV3 Ghana, on X, and on Facebook as well. Someone at George is member of parliament for the Ningo Pram Pram constituency, one of the sponsors of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill, and that's what we've been talking about. Now, before that, that quick break, you were saying, uh, giving me the, the timelines, after your parliament have done your work of approving this bill, the president has seven days to communicate to you. That is, if the bill has got into his desk. And you yes. say that you have information that all things being equal by Monday. Yeah, in the course of, the the, course the of course this of week. Next, uh, in the course week. of this, yeah, this okay. week okay. about to enter, I'm the, sure, the, 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 the I'm week sure we're getting get it. it. Yeah. Okay. So if that happens, the president has what, seven days to seven communicate Seven days to after you. it officially gets to his table. He has seven days to accent to it. Mm -hmm. And if he will not, then 14 days to communicate his reasons and for not accenting and the recommendations to fix whatever he thinks is wrong with the bill that's what the constitution says i see so that's 21 days in total well i would leave that to the constitutional lawyers to determine whether okay. it is seven plus 14 or, or seven, seven and an additional seven, seven to make 14. 14 i don't know <laughs> i think yeah. this is a matter that has come up before sure. but the president has already given us an indication of what he would be taken into consideration if this bill gets to his table to the extent that the reassurance he gives to the international community of Ghana's commitment to upholding human rights despite the recent passage of this anti-LGBTQ plus bill and, and making reference to this Supreme Court uh, suit by, by Richard Sky, there was one that as well has been running since June 2023. He says he would await the outcome of these lawsuits before a decision is taken. That cannot be within this period we're talking about. Well, well I, I don't know if that's going to be the form, the basis for the president's rejection, but the constitution... No, 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 a decision... A decision to, to, to reject. To, to, to take. Yes, it I mean, that, no, it, it, to... The, the, the constitution says he either accents or rejects. It doesn't mm -hmm. say he can wait. The, the constitution doesn't give him that room. The constitution says you either accent it or you reject Even it. Even when there's a court suit? The, the, the court suit has not placed an injunction on the president. It's one of the reliefs that Richard Sky is seeking in his yes. suit. Um, but again, we'll wait to see what the Supreme Court determines. Okay. Like you rightly pointed out, Amanda Odoi went to the Supreme Court in June 2023 to actually seek an injunction as one of her reliefs mm -hmm. against the Speaker of Parliament to stop the Speaker from considering doing the second consideration and doing the clause by clause consideration. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court set up a nine member panel chaired by the Chief Justice herself, Getru Tokono, mm -hmm. and they returned a 9 0 verdict against Amanda Odoi. Because on what basis are you asking the Supreme Court to stop Parliament from doing its job? And the, the Supreme Court was clear that they do not see what Parliament's work. What, what infringement of Amanda Odoi's rights or any citizen's rights would happen, would, 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 would be occasioned by mm -hmm. parliament doing his job. The president carrying out his constitutional mandate. It will be interesting to see how that would infringe the rights of anybody. So we'll, we'll wait and see because currently there is no law. There is, it, 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 we want to see if the Supreme Court can sit on a bill because the constitution is clear, you know, in Article 2 that, that he, you, would, you, would, you would, if there's an act of parliament, mm -hmm. parliament hasn't passed an act yet, we've passed the bill. The bill is going to the president. The president will have to accent before it becomes an act. So mm -hmm. on what, on, in fact, so, I, hold, so I this, hold the considered view. This anti-LGBT is still a bill. It's a bill. Because even though parliament has approved yes, it. Yes, it is only when it gets signed that it becomes an act. Else you can ask Richard Sky, who's gone to court, it, it is act what? Every act has a number. <laughs> that number has not been assigned yet. You understand me? And so um, I, I, I hold a respectful view, even though this matter is sub and before the, the Lord Justices of the Supreme Court, I hold a view that this matter is non-justiciable. It's non-justiciable. It's non-justiciable because it, it can only become justiciable when it, it is an act of parliament. But at this point in time, you cannot be seeking the, 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 the Supreme Court to interfere in the workings of parliament because the whole process of a private member's bill, which is the work of parliament, includes and is not limited to the transmission of the bill to the president and his response before that cycle of lawmaking is completed. One of the reliefs which the sky is seeking is that you, Parliament, exceeded your authority under Article 1062 and 108A in, in passing this uh, Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill 2024 as the same imposes a charge upon the Consolidated Fund and other public funds of Ghana. 
Again, moot point. Article 108 is clear. Article 108 says that the person presiding will make that determination. The person presiding is the Speaker of Parliament. He made that determination. And, and in fact, it is, I, I don't know, maybe the Supreme Court may be minded to, mm -hmm. to um, consolidate both cases because the reliefs being sought by Richard Sky are very similar to the reliefs being sought by Amanda Odo. And you can clearly see that they're coming from the same stable. The same puppet master is pulling the strings for both of them, you know, um, so that we don't wear the Supreme Court out. They should consolidate it and let us have one consolidated case. Let's deal with the matter uh, 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 that, that, that seems to be vexatious in nature. Has the speaker acted ultra virus Article 108? Because when you see the, the president's letter to the speaker relative to the witchcraft bill, the president seeks to make a determination on 108. That is not the president's prerogative. 108 says the person presiding will make that determination. We will not allow the president or any other arm of government seek to take away from parliament a constitutional mandate that is conferred on parliament. We don't go and determine for cabinet what decisions they should take in, in cabinet in parliament. Neither do we sit in judicial council meetings to determine who empanels a judge because the empanelment, empanelment of judges is the prerogative of the chief justice. It can't be the prerogative. The speaker cannot seek to do that job for for. But for, even for though them. the parliament is a master of his own rules, if your decisions you take is in contravention of the constitutional provisions, then certainly that, that cannot stand. Well, well, if we are in contravention, absolutely, that's where the Supreme Court steps in to defend the Constitution. Now, the Constitution does not say that we don't have the powers to make a determination on 108. Mm -hmm. We do. It confers that right on the person presiding. And the Speaker has made this clear. And that's why I think that this is fantastic. The Supreme Court will make a determination on who has the mandate to make the determination of financial consideration of pri on private members' bill. But you see, mm -hmm. let us be clear. You read the letter of the law, and you read the spirit of the law, and you understand the spirit of the law. For those who say that, oh, this bill infringes on 108 because people will go into, will be incarcerated. Ah, if that is the whole, if that is the spirit of 108, then, we, we as, we, then, then it means that we cannot have a private members' bill. Why? The Committee of Parliament, Constitutional, Legal, and Parliamentary Affairs, that considers private members' bills, mm -hmm. is cost to the state. So once you submit a private members' bill and Parliament considers it, it's cost to the state. The Attorney General makes an opinion on, on, on the bill. The work that is done in research by the state attorneys at the Attorney General's department and the Attorney General's time that he spends in appearing before the committee to make him, even the paper he prints his opinion on, is cost to the state. So then it means that you can never have a private member's bill because so long as Parliament would have to sit on it, the time of that committee, the public hearings of the committee on, on public private member's bill mm -hmm. are cost. So, but that cannot be the intent of the, 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 the framers of the constitution. And again, you need to bear in mind, that's why you need to have a fiscal impact analysis done on the bill. Because you want to see what is the potential of, of incarceration. And it's a very simple mathematical analysis to do. You look at the rate of incarceration of the public vis-a-vis -vis the general public population and strike a ratio of rate of incarceration. Look at what is the, rate, the, the, the population of the gay community in Ghana okay. and strike also the same ratio to see what potential incarceration rates could but be. But do we have and records then, of the gay community? Oh, there the, 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 the numbers on that. There are numbers there are on numbers that. Numbers? Oh, yes, yes. The, the gay community themselves, in some of their memos, presented the, the numbers that they think of their community in, in the country. Some have put it at about 150,000 people. Some have put it at 85,000 people. But there are numbers of, of, of the gay community. Now, when you have those ratios, you then look at the ratio of people leaving the prisons and people going into the prisons. Mm -hmm. the, look, this is, I mean, so there's, and, 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 and I'm confident that the fiscal impact analysis has been done. We're good to go. There is no new cost to the state. You're not employing new police officers mm -hmm. to say that you are now going to get new police officers or new prosecutors. You're not going to employ new judges. So, but like I said, we will get to the case before the court and we will be able to look at it. But this, this excuse, be it from the president or from the finance ministry, is is is. We're going to get into the finance ministry a bit. But one of the reliefs which which uh, the the plaintiff is seeking, even though I know we 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 have very limited conversations on this matter because we don't obviously don't want to be cited for for the contempt or, or subjudicate did parliament have a quorum in passing this bill because the plaintiff is questioning whether indeed parliament had a quorum 
based on the true and proper interpretation of Article 102 and 104. Of the 1992 constitution you know you know i have a favorite saying is that when you want to look into the eye of a dead man be careful what you see what you see may make you never sleep again on that same day we passed the anti-lgbtq law uh, did a third reading that same day we took under a certificate of urgency the anti-doping agency act mm -hmm. and government said we needed the anti-doping -agen agency act to be able to hold the african games the same quorum in fact there were less people in the chamber who passed the anti-doping act than were there when we even had the anti-LGBTQ bill or the family values bill mm -hmm. passed. But let me just be clear on this. The Supreme Court itself, in the E. Levy case, and on the issue of the budget refusal and, and otherwise, stated categorically on the issue of quorum what it is. The records of quorum are established with the votes and proceedings how many members of parliament signed into parliament. If at the time a decision is going to be taken, somebody raises an issue of quorum, and I think your marking was present in the chamber, if someone raises an issue of quorum, then a head count will be taken. But if an issue of quorum was not raised, it is assumed that per the vote and proceedings, if the numbers present on the vote and proceedings were sufficient to constitute quorum, you had quorum to transact government business. And like I said, to the government side, they need to be very careful because some of them are the puppet masters behind these suits. We are sitting back and watching what the Supreme Court will say. But I know very well, in the seven years I've sat in that parliament, in my eighth year now, I've seen us pass loans, major loans, with less than 20 people in the chamber. The finance ministry is concerned they are saying that if the president, in fact, they have advised the president not to assent this bill into law because Ghana stands losing the risk of losing about 3.8 billion, at the least, 3.8 billion dollars in various forms of, of funding if, if this bill is assented to, into law. Now, these are the, the, the sources. They say, one, they expected 300 million dollars financing from the first Ghana Resilient Recovery Development Policy the Operation Budget Support, which is currently pending parliamentary approval, is before you, uh, might not be disbursed by the bank when this is approved. Ongoing negotiations on the second Ghana Resilient Recovery, another $300 million. Another ongoing negotiations for the $250 million to support the Ghana Financial Stability Fund, which is supposed to cushion financial institutions that were hit by the domestic detection program. The disbursement of in undisbursed amounts totaling $2.1 billion for ongoing projects will be suspended. Preparation of pipeline projects and declaration of effectiveness for two projects totaling $900 million will be suspended. In total, some $3.8 billion. The finance ministry says we stand the risk of losing if the president assents to this bill. Complete bollocks. It is bollocks? Absolutely. This is the finance ministry talking. The finance ministry is engaged in, fan in peddling fanciful fears and they should, in fact, if we were a jurisdiction that was serious, the finance minister who ordered this should be facing prosecution for causing fear and panic under, under our legislation. Why? Because what he said, and I'm daring the finance minister. My the very, finance. He's my big brother. I've known him since 2007. F devout Muslim. Amin Anta, the Honorable Mohammed Amin Anta. I'm challenging Honorable Amin Anta to publish the way he published this document. Mm -hmm. Publish the letter from the IMF and the letter from the World Bank stating that Ghana is at risk of losing any of, this, any, any of these funds. I have spoken to sources within the IMF and the World Bank and they assure me that they have not made any such formal indication to the government of Ghana. They haven't made any such formal indication? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And you see, to, you see, because God does not like lies, he ab in fact, he detests and abhors lies. Uganda passed a legislation. And in fact, they've referenced Uganda in some of their conversations mm -hmm. that Uganda is facing stiff penalties. On the 6th of March, Ghana's Independence Day, the IMF released a press release number 24-72, heading, IMF Executive Board completes fifth review under the Extended Credit Facility Arrangement for Uganda. Uganda passed the law last year that punishes LGBTQ with death. 
Now, this is what the press statement from the IMF says. March 6, 2024. The executive board of the IMF concluded today the fifth review of Uganda's extended credit facility. This completion enables the immediate disbursement of the equivalent of special drawing rights, that's SDR, 90.25 million, about 120 million US dollars. Just on the sixth, last uh, Wednesday, this past Wednesday, Uganda has been disbursed $120 million. And you said this was on the 6th of March? 6th of March. I see. Press IMF website, press release number 24 stroke 72. So even Uganda, that has death as the punishment in their bill, is still getting releases under their IMF program. How then will Ghana, that has a three-year punishment, face a stiff penalty? This is a statement attributed to the IMF. They say they will comment on the passage of this proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill by parliament only after it has been signed into law. According to the fund, this would only follow an assessment of the economic and financial implications of the bill. In fact, there's a statement that I'm quoting from, from the IMF. Absolutely. And I know you've seen that statement. Uh, diversity and inclusion are values that the IMF embraces. The IMF did and, say... And this, is, and this is the heart of this oh, absolutely. Uh, opposition to so, the bill. So you see, the IMF did not say that... Once the bill is passed, they will withdraw or withhold funding. They said they would conduct an assessment of economic implications of the bill. Economic and financial implications. Economic and financial implications. Right. They did the same in Uganda. When Uganda passed its legislation in March 2023, they carried out an economic and financial assessment of the, of the, of the, of the law that was passed and determined that it had no consideration on the economy of, 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 of uh, Uganda. And Uganda's economy is just worth 53 billion. Mm -hmm. Ghana's economy is 78 billion. They, unless and until anybody can show us what the financial and economic implications of this bill are in an adverse manner to Ghana's government, the IMF statement in itself vindicates my position. This and their action, their action in Uganda, after Uganda passed a bill that punishes the same thing we are punishing with maximum three years, with death, they went ahead to say, this is your matter. And you know why? Because I've always made the point. The IMF in their statement say diversity and the inclusion. inclusion. There are values that the IMF embraces. Good. Now, diversity and inclusion as values mean that you, you respect and accommodate all shades of opinion. Indeed. Be they straight or gay. Are you considering and respecting the views and opinions of the gay I community? I am not the IMF. That is the IMF. And so that is why the IMF cannot punish Ghana for taking a position as a sovereign state that we are a straight nation. How far can you If we say, I'm coming, let me just land on this point. If we say we are a straight nation, the IMF will work with us as a straight nation. If another country or another entity comes and says they are gay, they will also work with them. But the IMF cannot say that because you are straight, I will not, I will not work with you. Then that will mean that the IMF is a part of the gay lobby. And the IMF says they are diversity and inclus inclusion oriented. So diversity means they work with people who are straight. They work with people who are gay. Why? Is it everybody who works at the IMF? From the, the, the executive director of the IMF, the, are, are, are they all gay people? No. You, you talk about Ghana being a sovereign state. I mean, how can we push this? How far, in fact, can we push this sovereignty argument when we go cap in hand begging? when we, 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 our sovereignty has limitations financially and economically. And that's why we're subservient to these institutions that would tell you this. So you're talking about the sovereignty of a state that cannot flex its financial muscles. How far can you go with that? Alfred, it brings me to the question of why are we even with the IMF? It's simply because the same people who are blackmailing us and telling us that we won't get money from the IMF, superintendent over the worst decline of our economy. The finance ministry, is responsible for managing the finances of our state. The president is responsible for ensuring the sustainability of our economy. He and his running mate, who tells us now that he's a mate and is now more of an IT guru boy than an economic whiz kid as he was sold to us, have messed up the economy. And after messing up the economy, they have the effrontery, the temerity, to look you and I in the face and tell you that we have messed up the economy so bad, we need to mortgage the innocence of your children and my children and the children of Ghanaians for $700 million, Ghana, uh, million dollars a year, because the 3.8 billion is over five years. 
It's not one year. So it means that for the managers of our economy, they've collateralized Get Fund, collateralized National Health Insurance, collateralized uh, ESLA, collateralized everything in this country. Now they want to collateralize the innocence of Ghanaian children. So they want to collateralize our cultural heritage for $700 million. It's a shame. Look, until and unless we begin to we begin to assert ourselves and own the levers of Ghana's economy. We cannot, we cannot continue. The president is the one who said Ghana beyond AIDS. But, but, but he that's, said, but he that's, said Ghana beyond AIDS. That's the reality we're dealing with right now. So this is a fantastic about opportunity. The, the, so the sovereignty of Ghana and that we should uphold our sovereignty. We are begging. We are begging because even at a time where our central bank declared bankruptcy, literally declared bankruptcy, where Ghana as a state is bankrupt, we are not paying any of our external obligations. We are asking foreign lenders to Ghana to take haircuts. We've, 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 we've given haircuts to pensioners in Ghana. The Bank of Ghana has made a loss of 60 billion and head of in the history of Ghana. At that time, the office of the president has increased the budget allocation to the office of the president. So it is the irresponsibility of the leaders of our country. When the president and, 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 and his vice are living like Arabian knights and kings, and leaving the rest of the population to run on a shoestring budget. There is austerity. They are cutting the budget of ministries that provide social services to the people of Ghana. But the Office of Government Machinery has increased its budget. You must begin to question where the problem is. Is our problem really the IMF or the people who are leading us? Well, this is their, the IMF is saying that well, for as long as you continue to rely on them for help, their internal policies prohibit discrimination based on personal characteristics, including but not limited to gender, gender expression, or sexual orientation. And I've said to you, with all of this same thing, they've just released $120 million to Uganda. So, so except the people who are interfacing with the IMF on behalf of Ghana are actually the ones pushing this gay agenda, the IMF will respect the sovereignty of a state. Because, and, and look, with, that, with the greatest of respect to Uganda, when it comes to the Committee of Nations, and when you come to Africa as a, as, a, as, a, as a continent, and you want to talk of countries that play a lead role, that are important in, the, in, the, in, the, in international relations and international conversations, Ghana plays a leading role than Uganda. Ghana is, is, is more at the forefront than Uganda. And listen, the West needs Ghana. The West needs Ghana. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, and I have made this point. When the American ambassador, Virginia Palmer, makes the case she makes, I make the simple point that any American business operating in Ghana today is not doing so because of LGBTQ. They are doing so because they are making a profit. And they would not leave Ghana because of LGBTQ when they look at their profit margin. And if they choose to pack bag and baggage and leave, another company will come in and make that profit. Ghana is a profitable country to do business in. And so we must, we must stop cheapening ourselves and making it look like we have no sense of self-worth. And I, that's why I question the president's circle of friends. Because the president said he's assuring Ghana's friends. Well, they're not Ghana's friends. They are his friends. Because no, that's, my, that's the Alfred, diplomatic community. Alfred, they're the friends Alfred, of Ghana, Alfred, not Alfred, the president Alfred, as an individual. Alfred, the president, the president as a former foreign affairs minister must have read Article 42 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Article 42 prohibits ambassadors of foreign missions in Ghana from doing what many of them are doing. Which is, what have they done? Which now? is involving themselves in local politics. But you know what, Kwame PNM, a respected economist, says that if the IMF has to take any decision at all when it comes to this anti-LGBTQ plus bill, which you, members of parliament, have passed into law, it should be targeted at you, the MPs, for taking this decision you should bear the brunt of whatever sanctions they would slap on Ghana because of that decision that you took. I speak for myself. I don't care. You don't care? And I've said it. Look, and I've said you, it. You're ready to bear if, the, if, the, if, the, the if brunt If, you, the if any country leads a sanction on the speaker or myself or the sponsors, I would wage a campaign in this country against all their business interests. And don't, don't underestimate the power of the forces of Ghanaians when we say we will shut down those businesses. It is, look, if they want to threaten us, we will issue threats. And I'm issuing that on your platform. If they touch the speaker or any member of parliament, we will 
come after their business interests in Ghana. He says your ex gratia should be withheld. That's some of oh. the issues that should be of concern to the Ghanaian people. Ex gratia, you see, and someone respected senior like Kwame Penim should know that this conversation of ex gratia is a whole conversation on his own. How much well, is the ex gratia? You are paying, as we speak, I'm in the fourth year of, this, of my second term in parliament. I don't know what my salary is. So if finally the presidential so emolument you committee... You don't, you don't know what your salary is. Means you are, you are not, I, don't have, not, I don't have terms of conditions. There are no terms of conditions for any member of parliament in this parliament, in the 8th parliament. We are yeah. being paid on the terms of conditions of the 7th parliament. So when they determine in, in, in maybe October what mm -hmm. the terms of conditions, the presidential emolument commission determines what the terms of conditions are, definitely nobody's salary. The law, Labour Act says you can't reduce somebody's salary. So definitely there will be increases. The differential... Is what is then lumped up over 48 months and paid to me. Is that an ex-gratia? You are paying my salary differential. So what is this ex-gratia conversation? And that's why I think that the respected Kwame PNM should know better than, than to... But like I said, if they think they have the power to issue threats to anybody in Ghana, they should go ahead. It's within their legitimate right. But it also is within our legitimate right for me to lead a demonstration and shut down their businesses. It will be fair. It will be quid pro quo. And they should wait. And prepare for it. Aren't you pushing this this uh, argument to, to the extreme? And I'm sure you've heard this before that the 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 consequences of this position could outlive this administration. And if, for instance, the NDC should win power in 2024, this election, you probably are going to be bearing the the consequences of some of the decisions that may be taken because of your stance. Let me state this here and now and end this conversation once and for all. This is not a political issue. It's about my it, children. It has, it has political. No, 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 no. Legs. Wait, no, no. The has, suggestion is that the suggestion is that I should think about ah, John Mahama, by God's grace, will be the president in 2025. John Mahama has at least on four public occasions stated that he does not believe in rights for LGBTQ or he does not believe in LGBTQ rights as a universal right. And that our society is the Ghanaian people are against it. As a leader, I would expect him to walk his talk as president of Ghana in 2025. You expect him to walk his talk? Absolutely. I mean, and I would demand same of him. The same way I'm demanding of President Akufado, I would demand same of him. That, that legislation will stand. I, I would oppose any decision by a future NDC government to say they are going to walk back this act. I will fight it. Because, like I said, it's about our cultural heritage and the innocence of my children and Ghanaian children. And the innocence of my children will not be mortgaged for any political party. And, 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 and like I said, President Mahama on his own has spoken. We've not heard from Dr. Baumia, so I can't say what his position is. But I've heard, and, that, and, and that's why a lot of people are holding President Akufado to his word. President Akufado has spoken at the Anglican Church, where he said it will not happen under his watch. So people are expecting you to walk your talk. Leadership is about walking your talk. I've seen people circulate a video from 2013 of myself talking about rights. They cut a video. It's a full 47 minutes interview on what was minority caucus at the time. And on that same platform, I stated clearly that homosexuality is a mental aberration of the highest order. And questioned at the time President Akufado, who had, at the time had not spoken about his sexuality, and said he should speak about his sexuality. And again, in 2013, you did not have people opening an advocacy office for LGBTQ rights. So the situation then and now are not the same. So essentially what you're saying is what happens in, in their rooms is none of your business. I have absolutely no concern. And it's, what it's you none did. of the business of this law. It is not the business of, of this, this law. Bill, of, of, of this bill. Absolutely. This bill is not interested in what you do. It is when you choose to bring your private pro proclivity into the space of public discourse that public policy will apply to it. Because Alfred, how can I determine who you slept with last night in your bedroom, unless you choose to make it a subject of public conversation or allow evidence to appear before a competent court of jurisdiction. And again, let's not forget that in this, in this bill, for the first time, we codify protections for members of the LGBTQ community in Section 17, where we say that anybody who verbally or physically assaults a person on suspicion of involvement in an act prohibited under this bill or under this act as it is, is, is stated you'll be subjected to section 84 to 87 of the criminal offenses act which means you can go to jail for physically or verbally assaulting people and that's why we impose a duty to report to relevant authority instead of people exacting jungle justice on individuals 
If the president comes back after 14 days or 21 days, or however it plays out, to say that, you know what, as I indicated to you, there's a, a Supreme Court suit. I want to wait for the outcome. And, and so I cannot accent to this bill into law. What would Parliament's position be? Well, I can't speak for Parliament, but my personal position would be that the president would have breached the Constitution. He will be acting in flagrant violation of the Constitution. The Constitution does not say that he can stay decision. It says he either votes, accents, or decides or states emphatically that I will not accent. So it is either or. There's no middle ground. If he does not accent? If he does not accent, then he should state why. The Constitution again says if you are not accenting, you state why you are not accenting. And it must be subject to provisions of the bill, not something that is exogenous or extraneous to the bill. It's after 67 years of gaining independence, we still don't have our sovereignty intact to even want to be able to flex our muscles in, in full scale and resist some of these concerns that have been raised. I mean, 67 years down the line. That certainly is a fundamental concern, at least for the many people who, who talk about this and also take into consideration the impact that this would have economically. Very true. I mean, you look at Ghana, 67 years old, and our pensioners are having to deal with a haircut. You've had the former Chief Justice having to go and pick it for days on end so that she can get her, her life savings. Um, you look at us. 67 years old and uh, the biggest pride we have is that we have the most expensive Galamse Pete in the world uh, called the National Cathedral. Um, you, you, you look at us as a country and 57 years, 67 years down the line, uh, eight people were killed in cold blood, murdered in cold blood by men of the Ghana Armed Forces. The president is commander in chief of the Armed Forces. The president has delivered four state of the nation addresses since then. He's not uttered a word about the loss of eight Ghanaian lives. You sit in a country 67 years on, human negligence, and, and I'm saying this on authority, human negligence led to the spillage of the Akosombo Dam. And I have the evidence here to show you that the engineers at VRA, negligence on their part is what led to this whole crisis that we are in, the essential the president, reason was to the protect president, the integrity the president, of the dam. No, no. And if you, you talk see? about negligence, that has been you challenged see? by the VRA itself. You that see? they consistently you see? You give, see? give give the notices you see? And, and 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 some uh, also the calls to to the people within the catchment area as well. So if you say that th this was this was negligence, well, that's that's at variance with what the VRA Bro. itself. Uh, Alfred, is Alfred. The rains started in the catchment area in July 2023. And the volumes received from January to June in relation to the long-term average. There's something called the long-term average. The long-term average looks at how much water is accumulated over a 10-year period. And you use that as a mean to calculate and see whether you're going to have high levels or not. It is known that the 2023 values between January and June were five times that five times that of the long-term average. So mm -hmm. it was clear as early as July that we were in a crisis because you had had five times the mean average. Now, the mean average, mm, the long-term average, is 1.5 million meter cube of water. By, <laughs> by June 2023, we had got 6.5 million cubic meter or meter cube of water. This was clear. On the 14th of July, 2023, the dam water levels crossed the lower rule curve of 276 feet at a headwater elevation of 265.18 feet. A week later, on 22nd of July, the 277 feet rule curve was crossed at an elevation of 266.08 feet. On the 9th of August, the upper limit rule curve of 278 was crossed at a headwater elevation of 267.16 feet. All these were clear signs. As far as, as far back as July to August, clear signs that there was too much water coming into the reservoir and they needed to start spilling immediately. They waited till September 15th to start the spillage. 
and then to protect the integrity of the dam, had to spill at the volumes at which they did. Tell me this is not human negligence. People should be rotting in jail for now, by now, for this kind of crime. This cost over 13, displaced over 16,000 people, affected 13 constituencies in this country. People are walking around for free. And the president did not have the milk of human compassion to even acknowledge the Kosombo dam spillage victims in his sonar. Well, he did it in the Independence Day speech. After, 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 after we had called him out? Well, After it, we had called it, it, him This out? issue that you raised, is Parliament going to seek some... some I am some going to be audience? making a formal complaint to the Speaker on the basis of this for an independent, a bipartisan parliamentary investigation into this matter. Into the Akosombo? Into the Akosombo, because look, okay. these are the figures. I, nobody has ever put out these figures, but I have taken my time to get these figures. And to expose the fact that the engineers... And look, we've done spillage over the years. The engineers who've done the previous spillages, spillage was done under Professor Mills. The engineers who did that are present. They are currently there. But VRA doesn't want to talk to them because they say they are NDC people. This is Hot Issues here on TV3, also live on TV3 Gun on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. My guest, Samuel Natijal, is the Member of Parliament for the Ningo Prom Prom constituency, one of the sponsors of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill, and then also a deputy ranking on the communications Committee of Parliament, right after this quick break, we'll have a conversation on the news of the decision by the flag bearer of the NDC, John Ramani Muhammad, to retain Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman as the running mate of the party going into the December 7, 2024 presidential elections, right after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Hot Issues here on TV3. The Honorable Samuel Nate George is Member of Parliament for the Ningo Prom Prom Constituency, Deputy Ranking on the Communications Committee of Parliament, one of the sponsors of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill, which has been approved by Parliament awaiting presidential accent. And that's a conversation we've been having over the period. Now, another issue as well that he, as a member of the National Executive Committee of the NDC, has has also been involved in over the period until the announcement of Professor Nana Jinopoko Ajiman as running mate of John Romani Mahama uh, was made public on Thursday. Uh, it's what we're getting in, into now. Is that one that, uh, Nana, Nana George, you, you supported? Nana, Professor Nana Jinopoko Ajiman as uh, flag bearer? Um, Sorry, the running mate the, of, of the, John the running mate. Absolutely, but let me just state one thing on the, on the 67th independence anniversary. Yes. One minute. Quick, quick one. I think that the president owes the Gandangwe people an apology. Why? For the, the unforgivable statement he made that Tetekwashi, a proud son of Gadangwe land, was Gadangwe, was former B, aka J. Wogbomoni. I mean, that's, that's unforgivable. Completely unforgivable. And you know, it, it, it is worrying for me because, again, the Gandang Metahulu Aipe met with me last week and drew my attention to something I had never noticed. Which is? In, the, in Greater Accra region, every circle, every roundabout has a statue of the person it is named after, except mm -hmm. the Tekwashi Interchange. The only roundabout, okay, well, Obeche Bilamte is there. Well, there's Akwaje. And Akwaje. Yes, but they all have statutes of the people. Akwaje. Yes, there's a statue. Akwaje. Akwaje. Akwaje, there's no, because yeah. there's no land, there's no space uh -huh. for a statue. But at Tetekwashi, there is space for a statue. At Tetekwashi, Akwaje, the way Akwaje is, is designed. Well, because you said there, there, is no there space. are statues on, at every. Yes, that's what but Akwaje does not have space for a statue. Okay. But, but everyone that has a statue, Obechebi Lamte, there's a statue there. Dankwa, there's a statue there. Kwame Nkrumah, there's a statue there. Tetekwashi doesn't have a statue. And then you then decide to take an illustrious son of Gandangwe and say that he doesn't come from the land. The president owes us an apology. And it must happen within the next seven days. You want the president to apologize in Absolutely, seven days? Absolutely, because that is, that is an unpardonable mistake to make. He cannot seek to rewrite history. And we won't accept that. As a proud Gandangwe son, I will not... Accept that from the president. And I expect the, 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 the chiefs of Gadangwe to rise up. 
Well, and right this wrong. I've seen that some of them have spoken. To, the Honorable Nia Iko to is a former attorney exactly. you know, general, and he spoke about it. Yes, has issued a statement to that effect. To that effect, so, you know, um, and, and no, but we want to see more action. The Gun Chief must speak. The government chair must speak. The, the traditional council must speak. The, the regional house of chiefs must speak. We can't, we can't, we can't continue to have this revisionist attempt of our of, of our history. You know, they're, they're trying to revise. It first, it started with Kwame Nkrumah. Now it is it's Tete Kwashi. We won't accept that. Okay. Now to Professor Nana Jeno Pokwajiman. I think a fantastic decision made by His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. It situates the focus of the next administration. And I'm confident and prayerful in my, in my belief that John Mahama will form the next government come 7 January 2025 with Professor Nana Jeno Pokwajiman as his running mate. Prof is a woman of integrity. She's a woman of stellar reputation. She has no corruption associated to her in over 40 years of public service. In 2020, when she was outdoored, the NPP embarked on an expedition search in UCC to see if they could find any acts of corruption on her. They didn't find. She's a woman who stands squeaky clean when it comes to integrity and what is needed for the high office of vice president, especially after it's been desecrated. By the current occupant of that office. It's been desecrated. Absolutely. Ah, but if ah. we elect you as if, if you are if you are if you are elected with a flag bearer to be vice president and you reduce that office to the office of an aplanke, of a mate, that's desecration of that very respectable office. That's supposed to be the office of the head of the economic management team. So, and so, so, and so for me, Nana General Pokwajima bringing to this office, if so elected. She compliments John Mahama in more ways than one. She brings the focus of the next administration on fixing the mess that has been left behind by Nanado and his mates Mahmoud Baumia. She comes to office with that focus that allows a level playing field for the succession of John Dramani Mahama. She comes to the office with a stellar integrity that is needed for the functioning of the next administration in dealing with the corruption that has become endemic in that office of the vice president, where digitization has become a tool for enriching and building campaign war chests and not for the betterment of the public, the, the, the public space. She comes to that ticket as a mother figure that this country needs at a time where we have been basically like motherless children because the president has checked out as far back as last year. The president checked out of the country. He checked out of the office of the president. He went to Ashanti region. He's still president of the Republic of Ghana. In name. He is functioning. In form, not in substance. You, you're not seeing? Oh. The president told us last year, Tom, that the problems of Ghana will not be fixed by him. They will be fixed by the person who comes after him, John Mahama. Did he mention John John is the one coming after him. He did mention your mom. No, he didn't, but he says the person coming after him. And I'm mm -hmm. prophesying, I'm speaking, I'm speaking that which does not does not exist as though it were. It's the principle of faith. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a child of God. I'm speaking it into being that John Mahama will be the next president. He said the person who comes after him will be the one to fix the problems. And if you look at the people who are coming after him, John Mahama, a man who has the track record of fixing things like Dumso. Did he fix Dumso? Oh. But Mahmoud Baumia, when he did 100 days in office, said we should not give John Mahama credit for fixing Doomsaw because even though he fixed Doomsaw, people's businesses were hurt. So well, he admitted. Well, 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 Bonsu, Mensa, they they oh, Doomsaw. Che Mensa Bonsu himself admitted on Sumpa Radio that yes, John Mahama fixed Doomsaw. He fixed Doomsaw. That one is not, I mean, they should tell you what they've done to fix Doomsaw. There are Mary and Kappa warships. Why? Is it Nanado and Baumia who brought it? You know, John Mahama has a track record of fixing things, you know? You couldn't fly into Kumasi after 5 p.m. He said, no, Kumasi is, a, is the second biggest metropolis in, uh, in Ghana. It's, it's a thriving regional capital. We need to be able to fly in there at night. He's made it an international airport. He says people are traveling to, to Hajj for Hajj. They have to do the perilous journey by road from Tamale to Accra. No, I will fix this. They should fly out straight from there. Build the Tamale interna International so what, Airport. What was the this, is a man, this is a man who fixes. So when Nanado says the problems will be fixed by my successor, you have one who fixes, and you have another one whose job is to be a mate. And just say that, and just say that media, whatever I say, Masa know they agree. So, 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 so the question is, who do you think Nanado was really talking about 
when he spoke prophetically that the person coming after him will fix the problem. So what's going to be the complementary role of... No, no, that's what I've said to you. That she gives government a tunnel vision focus. So government is focused. The government of Ghana is focused on fixing the problems of Ghana and okay. building the Ghana that Ghanaians want. You don't, you don't, you're not saddled with a problem of a successor problem starting within the presidency. No, 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 no. Nana brings the focus. She brings the calm of a mother, the steel of a university professor, brings the astuteness of an English professor and comes with the humility of a mother to this table. And she helps John Mahama focus and deliver on fixing the problems of this country. There is no better choice at this point in time than Nana Jane. And I, I doff my heart out to President Mahama because he's proved two things to me. One, picking Nana in 2020 was not tokenism. It wasn't a feminist plot or, 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 or prank. It wasn't tokenism. He understands and values her import and her, her, her value to the ticket. Two, he realizes the gravity of the task ahead of him. That as leader of the NDC and president of Ghana, he must be able to segment his two positions such that the leadership of the NDC and its succession planning mm -hmm. does not affect his delivery as president of Ghana. For me, a man who is awake to this responsibility is a man I can trust to lead this country over the next you four know, years. Because prior to the, the announcement of yes. Professor Nana Jinopokwajiman, there was that conversation about the, the consideration of your succession in the choice of who partners yes. John Mahama going into yes. 2024, so as to be a period of preparation for, for the person in, for, for the 2028 elections. Now, you're saying that the focus now for the party is to win power. The succession then may have even started, from what you're saying, the succession conversation about who, who takes over from John Mahama has, has already started. Right? The, the succession of John Mahama is a function as leader of the NDC and flag bearer in 2028 mm -hmm. is a function of the NDC. As a party. As a party. The governance of Ghana, picking Ghana from the precipice, from the doldrums, from the nadir of despair, where Nanado and Baumia have plunged this country, the darkness we've been plunged into, and, and resetting this country and setting it on the right trajectory. It's going to be a function of the president of Ghana. So what do you say to those groups within your party who were also asking for the consideration of a much younger person to prepare the person for 2028? You have a responsible father and mother. And so to the young people of the NDC, let's be proud of the decision our father has made. Because now you have a father and mother who are preparing the way for their son to come. Even Jesus Christ who is God in, in human flesh, did not just come like that. There had to be a John the Baptist to prepare the way for him. Samuel Nate George is a member of parliament for the Nigo Pram Pram constituency. He is a deputy ranking on the Communications Committee of Parliament. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. We wanted to talk about the issues in the communication sector. But I know there's a conversation we'll definitely, we'll definitely have. have. Um, because of the, a lot that is happening in that particular area, the communication space in this country. And then also one of the sponsors of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill, which has been approved by Parliament, awaiting presidential accent. Thank you very much for coming. On hot issues. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you very much for making the time to join us here on Hot Issues on TV3. We're also live on three, uh, TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you for watching us. I was clothed today by Mali Express. You can find them on Instagram and Facebook, Mali Express. My name is Alfred Akonse. If I say who clothed me, that one, you give the person I'm, an I'm invoice. I'm telling you, that one is the top <laughs> part of it. Uh, yes. Uh, you're, I sat in for your regular host, Kemeni Amano, who returns next week. Have a great weekend.